session. Uh, the next talk is uh, lattice-based succinct argument for NP with polylogarithmic time verification. And Jonathan Bottle will, will present. Go ahead. Thanks very much for the introduction. This talk is about succinct arguments in which a prover tries to convince a verifier that an NP statement is true using their witness. The prover and verifier interact, exchanging lots of messages. And at the end of the conversation, the verifier decides whether or not they were convinced by the, the prover's messages. Succinct arguments should satisfy a few properties, including completeness, soundness, um, and they should have proof sizes, which are much, much smaller than the size of the instance. So you know, sublinear or hopefully even polylogarithmic in N. And similarly, the verification time should be much, much less than the time taken to check whether the instance is true directly. Actually, in general, to allow succinct verification, you also need one more ingredient. You need pre-processing so that the verifier doesn't have to do um, O of N work to read the instance. So in this setting, we'll be considering pre-processing arguments uh, where a pre-processor takes the instance and then produces a small digest, which it gives to the verifier who runs succinctly after that. So let's look at the landscape of post-quantum succinct arguments. So first of all, there are hash-based arguments. And these are nice in that they have a, a transparent setup and they only rely on the security of your favorite hash function. But in practice, they have uh, somewhat large proof sizes. And this has led people to seek other approaches. And one thing we can do if we want to construct other types of post-quantum succinct arguments is to take inspiration from pre-quantum ones so there are pre-quantum proof systems like Gross 16, which have really tiny proofs, but rely on a trusted setup and strong non-falsifiable assumptions. And there are also proof systems like, like Dory, which have slightly larger proofs, still quite good, um, but then they have a transparent setup and they just rely on standard assumptions. So one way to make progress is to try and uh, port over these types of arguments to the post-quantum setting. And that's been done with arguments like Grod16. So as an example, there are lattice-based proof systems based on strong non-falsifiable assumptions with a trusted setup. Um, one example of this is uh, a paper ACLMT22. Um, these still have quite, quite large proof sizes in practice, but uh, the triple asterisk on the slide indicates that I'm kind of hopeful that this is going to improve because this is a very new line of work. Um, and actually, I just want to say that um, on the slide, it says non-falsifiable assumptions. But there were also some talks presented earlier this week. So uh, one presented by Valerio, who's just over there, so you can ask him about it. And one presented by Sai, who's just over there, so you can ask him. But some of these proof systems um, don't actually rely on non-falsifiable assumptions, um, slightly weaker ones, but still non-standard assumptions, so not just CIS or LWE. Um, anyway, you can ask those two how those proof systems have been improved. Because our goal is something different. It's actually to draw inspiration from the pre-quantum arguments based on standard assumptions and produce something in the middle. So a lattice-based succinct argument with a transparent setup uh, based on standard assumptions. There is progress in this direction, um, which leads us to be hopeful that this approach can be concretely efficient in the end. So Labrador, another paper presented earlier this week, gets proof sizes of about 50 kilobytes, but unfortunately this work doesn't have succinct verification yet. Um, so there's still room to make progress. And the last thing I should say is, of course, you know, hash-based arguments, you can instantiate them under whatever kind of cryptographic assumption you want. Well, what's different about these arguments on the left is they don't just use generic hash properties, they use homomorphic cryptography, so homomorphic commitments and things like that. And that's what we'll be doing today. So to replace this question mark with a concrete protocol, the question we'll be answering is, can we construct transparent, succinct arguments from standard lattice assumptions? Our main result is a succinct argument system for R1CS, which is an NP-complete language that covers uh, circuit satisfiability and all the other languages you would like. And to construct our succinct argument for R1CS, 
we rely on a structure called bilinear modules where we have a left module and a right module and a bilinear map which multiplies left and right elements together to give you an element in the third module, which is like empty, the target module. Um, so this is quite abstract, but if you want, you can think of this as a mathematical structure over which you can compute generalized Pedersen commitments and run a kind of generalized Schnorr protocol. Actually, we'll need more than just uh, normal bilinear modules. We'll actually need several levels of different bilinear modules, um, and they're going to have maps that, that connect them together, uh, as we're going to see. So for an ONCS instance with matrices of size n by n, our main result is if that you have log n levels of bilinear modules, you can come up with um, a very abstract, succinct argument for ONCS over a, a particular ring. So seeing this for the first time, it's pretty hard to, to see what this all means. So perhaps it's easier to show you the corollaries that we get by instantiating the bilinear modules in different ways. Our first corollary is the lattice-based succinct argument from the title of the talk. And we get this by instantiating all of the bilinear modules under, uh, under well, with, with rings and under lattice assumptions like ring sifts. And what's also interesting is that under a different instantiation based on bilinear pairings, we get you know, a different type of pairing-based argument which inherits the same efficiency properties. And this is related to this, uh, this prior work from the earlier slide, Dory, and another variation of that protocol. Um, so in some sense, we were, able to, um, we were able to capture the essence of those protocols using our bilinear module abstraction, and then, um, and then you know, shift over to lattices just like we wanted to do. Our construction method is to start with an information theoretic protocol called a polynomial IOP, and then take polynomial commitment schemes, which are built from some other arguments from prior work, BCS21, called sum check arguments. And whenever you have a polynomial IOP and a polynomial commitment scheme, you can combine them together using a compiler, and it spits out a new argument system. The polynomial IOP that we use is quite efficient and has succinct, well, it has good verification complexity, but unfortunately the polynomial commitment scheme has a linear time verifier O of N. Um, and this is inherited from those BCS21 sum check arguments. And it's also inherited by the argument that comes out of the compiler, uh, which is just not good enough. So to improve things, we actually improve the polynomial commitment scheme using a delegation protocol using even more sum check arguments from BCS21, which lets us overcome the bottleneck in verification, improving to log squared n verification time. And this filters through into the, the final protocol, which becomes a, a succinct argument. Now, there is a slight increase in proof size from log to log squared n as well. We did have to do various things to make the polynomial IP work over lattice-based rings, and that was also interesting to think about. But for today, I'm just going to focus on the details of the polynomial commitment scheme and the, the delegation protocol that we used. So let's dive into how to construct polynomial commitments with efficient verification. Polynomial commitment scheme is a protocol which starts off with a key generation algorithm. And then using this key, you can, co you can compute succinct commitments to, um, to different polynomials. This should, just like a normal commitment scheme, this should satisfy a, a binding property for security. But what makes polynomial commitment schemes interesting is an evaluation protocol. In this protocol, the instance is a key and a commitment and some inputs and outputs to a polynomial. And the prover wants to convince the verifier that they know the polynomial inside the commitment and that it satisfies the correct input and output relation. The commitment schemes, the polynomial commitment schemes we're interested in are taken from BCS21. And luckily you don't really need to know too much about what goes on inside BCS21. All you really need to know for now is that if you have a key of length n, and a polynomial with n coefficients, then 
the evaluation protocol has the logarithmic number of rounds, logarithmic communication between the prover and the verifier. For most of the protocol, the verifier has to do a logarithmic amount of work, except for one annoying step at the end of the protocol, where the verifier has to do O of N operations to evaluate a polynomial. So if you look closely, you'll see that the verifier is evaluating a polynomial in the commitment key. So different polynomial from the, the message polynomial that was committed to. So this is the expensive operation, the evaluation of, of this key polynomial. Our goal is to delegate this computation to the prover so that the verifier doesn't have to do all of the work. So how can we do that? Well, instead of the verifier doing this work at the end of the protocol, of course, we ask the prover to evaluate the polynomial and send the result to the verifier. But then, of course, since we want to make sure that the prover doesn't cheat, um, we need a way to check that the prover did this evaluation correctly. So we, we've already got an evaluation protocol to check the evaluations of polynomials, and we can just use it again. So yeah, we can, we can change the witness from the message polynomial to the key polynomial so that the verifier doesn't have to do the, the huge amount of work of, um, of reading the original key. Um, we can have a pre-processing phase which commits to the key um, under a new key. So we've got our compression of the instance for succinct verification. And, and this all looks fine and good, except that you know, we reach the end of the protocol and we realize that we've, we've just committed to the, the old key under a new one of the same length. And we've just pushed the problem onto a polynomial evaluation using the new key. So we need to do better than this. What we'd really like to do is change this uh, length n key for a shorter one. And then we'd have made a slight improvement. The verifier would be doing slightly less work at the end of the protocol. And after that, we'd just be able to recurse. So unfolding everything, the final protocol we would get in that case looks something like this. We start off with a whole collection of keys, length n, length n over two, going all the way down to one. We commit to all those keys in a pre-processing phase. And then we run the evaluation protocol for the polynomial commitment scheme repeatedly. And when you add up all the costs, um, you, you see that the, the verifier becomes uh, a log squared n operation verifier. Um, so that's the kind of protocol we want to create. And this, this approach that we're using here, it directly, uh, it's directly drawn from, um, from, from these prior works, so Lee21 and Tala, um, these pairing-based protocols. And what we need to explain how to do um, to make this approach work is to explain how we can commit to commitment keys and prove statements about those um, because they may be from a different domain than the original message and how we can reduce the key length from n to n over two at each step. So first we'll deal with the challenge of committing and proving to commitment keys. So we'll take a slightly closer look at how these polynomial commitments work. Um, a commitment scheme over a bilinear module looks something like this. So um, we've already seen the left, right, and target modules from a bilinear module, ML, MR, and MT. We know we have a bilinear map to let us multiply left and right elements together. And we can commit to small elements from the left module basically by taking a key from the right module using E to multiply message and key elements together, and then adding everything up to get a single element of MT. And this commitment scheme is binding under this, the assumption that it's hard to find small elements from ML, um, which, which give you zero when you feed them into this calculation. You can instantiate the this bilinear module commitment idea um, using pairings under the, um, the SXDH assumption. Or, use, or you can get lattice space commitments using ring sys. And inside a polynomial commitment scheme, we end up with something that just samples uniformly random keys from MR and commits to message polynomials by taking the vector of coefficients and committing to them using this process. And when we plug in all the details of this, 
into the description of uh, polynomial commitment scheme from earlier, this is the kind of statement that, um, that the evaluation protocol from BCS21 deals with, these scalar product relations over bilinear modules. So the reason we need the levels is so that we can commit to keys again um, as part of the message space in another bilinear module. So if we start off with our first bilinear module, ML1, MR1, and MT1, the keys are in MR1. And if we want to commit to those again in another bilinear module, somehow we need a way of mapping the keys, oh, or even again and again, somehow we need a method of mapping the keys from MR1 into the message space for the next level, so ML2. So we need a map going from the MRs to the MLs. And we'll be committing and proving uh, statements about polynomials. So we also want some preservation of polynomial arithmetic so that when we prove something in the message space ML2, it implies something about polynomial evaluation in MR1. So it turns out the algebraic condition that we end up with is uh, ring homomorphisms between MR1 and ML2 and all the other levels as well. And these two homomorphisms should cancel each other out. So if you imagine for a moment that the keys might be elements of ZP, then the U map can just forget that you're working mod P and give you an integer. And then the D map can just reduce mod P again. But of course, we also want the, the bilinear relation assumption at each level. So we'll check out an example lattice instantiation. Uh, so our first lattice instantiation uh, uses keys um, in a lattice-based ring working modulo Q1. And we want these keys to become small elements in the message space for another commitment scheme. So what we can do is just forget that we're working mod Q1, get some integers of maximum size Q1. And we want those to be small. So for our next key space, we can choose elements modulo Q2, where Q2 is much bigger than Q1. And we can use the same kind of trick to get a bigger modulus Q3 to commit to those key elements. The bilinear relation assumptions we need for the commitment schemes are implied by ring sys at each level. But the problem with this instantiation is that the moduli get bigger and bigger and bigger. And this causes us problems when trying to set parameters for our scheme. So in the end, we consider um, a very slightly more complicated instantiation where we bit decompose the key elements um, as well as forgetting that we're working mod Q. And this gives us really small integers to work with. And then we can use the same modulus RQ again, and we can have a level by linear module with as many levels as we like. And then we only rely on a single ring sys assumption as well. So to address challenge two and explain how to reduce the, the key length, we need to deal with the problem that, well, essentially, if we want to reduce the key length, we can't commit to a key of length n using a key of length n over 2 using this commitment scheme. To address this issue, you can do the obvious thing and just split the key of length n into two parts, have the preprocessing algorithm commit to each of those separately. And now the only thing we need to do is change the witness and change the relation that the prover is proving to the verifier so that it's a statement about um, keys of length n over 2 instead of n. And we can do this using the properties of multilinear polynomials to rearrange to get statements about keys of length n over 2, and also using the homomorphic properties of, um, of commitments. So in sum, for the whole argument, we start off with this preprocessing algorithm which produces commitments to all the keys of different sizes in two halves. Then we run the polynomial, um, the polynomial commitments evaluation protocol. We split the key in two. We imply this embedding map to move to a different bilinear module. And we fix various technicalities that arise there, which you can read about in our paper. And then after doing this repeatedly, we come up with our protocol with succinct verification. So as a summary of uh, the results we were able to prove, our main theorem was 
a very general and abstract succinct argument over these general bilinear modules and a particular ring which has succinct verification, um, verification cost over log squared n and the same proof size. And when we instantiate, instantiate that using uh, ring sys, we get a lattice-based succinct argument. And there are other choices of instantiation as well. Um, but going back to the first slide, um, our original goal was to get something which could possibly complete, compete with hash-based arguments in terms of uh, concrete, concrete efficiency. And this argument is not quite concretely efficient yet. Um, in fact, far from it. So I'd like to explain just a little bit about how you might go about building a more concretely efficient argument. So our argument system first runs a protocol on the message and then on smaller and smaller and smaller keys. And this is you know, reminiscent of one of the explanations of this uh, pairing-based protocol from prior work. And you know, we've got a last instantiation on our general instantiation in, in our paper. One thing you could do to improve the concrete efficiency would be to replace the base polynomial commitment scheme with something else more concretely efficient. And another approach is to note that this protocol has log squared n communication and rounds. If we rearrange the protocol a little bit and start trying to do some of these, these things in parallel, we can see a protocol with log squared communication and log rounds. And actually, if we try and combine those in like an interesting and creative way, the kind of thing that they do in one of these pairing-based protocols, we can aim for a protocol with log n communication and rounds. So we know how to do this based on pairings, but it was kind of it was kind of difficult and really unwieldy to do this in our general framework. Um, if you look at what's going on inside this protocol, um, the protocol is repeatedly reducing large messages and large keys simultaneously to smaller messages and, and smaller keys. So I think it would be really cool to use some um, some prior work like um, like this concretely efficient Labrador protocol that I mentioned to um, to go through these optimizations and try and aim for some really concretely efficient arguments. Um, but I'm sure that you can do better than I can. So my last task of the talk is to delegate this to, to you and see if you can do better. So thank you very much. Thank you. Any question? Yeah. Thanks for the talk. Um, I know it's not quite there for practical efficiency, but, um, for a secure for like security, how large do you need the modulus Q to be um, in your scheme for like any kind of me like what you deem meaningful for like a security level? Um, in in terms of concrete parameters. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm afraid I'm afraid I don't know. I didn't actually didn't actually try to calculate it because uh, you know I had had these uh, these future optimizations in mind, and you know I think I think it's just going to be. This is, I mean, this is a theoretical contribution. I think it's going to be improved quite, quite quickly. So, you know, in some sense, I think um, it's, it's just better to do that and then um, calculate the parameters uh, later, you know, when we expect it to be more efficient. Thank you. Any other question? Not, let's thank the speaker. And we'll move to the next, which is the last but not least talk in this session. And it is about re revisiting cycles of pairing friendly elliptic curves. And the speaker is uh, Javier Silva. Um, oh. Does it work? Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, uh, this is joint work uh, with Marta Bellez Muñoz and Jorge Jimenez Urroz. Uh, Marta is also here in the audience. I don't see Jorge. He was around uh, earlier. He might still be around. Uh, so uh, we'll be talking about uh, cycles of pairing friendly elliptic curves. So I'll start by introducing the, the core problem, which is uh, just a pure mathematical problem, which is uh, we're going to look for two elliptic curves 
uh, e and e prime, and one is defined over f phi, and the other is defined over f uh, q. And the interesting thing is that the the size of the base field of one of the curves determines the number of points of the other. So if one curve is over f q, it has p points, and the other is over f phi, has q points. And the problem, as I have just stated, is very clean, and it's also an easy problem. Uh, there are many instances of uh, cycles that we can find like this. Uh, what is in, more interesting is when we consider the case of pairing friendly curves. So we want both curves to be pairing friendly, which means that it is efficient to compute a pairing on these curves. And in concrete terms, this will mean that there's a concrete arithmetic relation between P and Q. Uh, in which, uh, I will get into more detail later about this. Uh, but for now, just keep that in mind that this is the hard version of the problem. So now um, I want to zoom out a bit and uh, talk about, uh, about uh, what's the motivation for this problem. Where does it come from in cryptography? And the, the place it comes from is a recursive, pro, uh, recursive composition of proof systems. So the setting is the following. You have uh, uh, an arbitrary computation, C, whatever, and you want to compose it with itself many times. So you get uh, you start from some input uh, x0, you plug it into C, you get x1, and maybe someone else comes and runs C again uh, on x1 and gets x2. And on each step, you might get some uh, secret input. That's the w's that come uh, from the top. Uh, and you want to prove uh, the correct evaluation of this whole thing uh, with something better than the trivial approaches, like producing independent proofs for each of the steps. So something that you can do. Uh, is to start for, for the first step, just uh, wrap this into uh, our snark, your favorite snark, and produce a proof of the correctness of uh, the evaluation of C on input x0 and output x1. Another interesting thing, instead of doing the same for the second proof, what you do is uh, you take the verification algorithm of this snark that you're using and you write it as a circuit. And you plug this into the, the snark and produce a proof that attests to the validity of two statements. The first statement is that uh, the second step of the computation has been performed correctly. And the second uh, statement is that you have checked, you have verified the previous proof and it has been accepted. So in turn, this tells you that the first step was also computed correctly by just checking the second proof. And of course, nothing prevents you from doing this again and again. And you have uh, a proof pi three, which attests to the correct evaluation of the three statements. And you can do this for as long as you want. Uh, so the interesting thing about this is that there is only one proof that you keep sort of updating. Uh, and any time anyone who wants to check the whole computation so far just needs to check the latest proof at, the, at that point. And we will be focusing on the case of uh, pairing-friendly snark. So imagine that this proof system that you're using is a pairing-friendly snark. And one important point when trying to, uh, to do something like this is that we need to be able to write this verification algorithm in the language that the snark understands. Uh, in principle, you can prove anything with a snark, but you need to fit it into the snark in the right format. So let's uh, zoom in a bit and, and see what I mean by this. So when we deal with a pairing friendly snark, um, we instantiate it using an elliptic curve. So we take an elliptic curve E that is over some prime field, and this curve has P points. And this P is, uh, is a, the important parameter for the snark because it tells us that this, the inputs uh, to the circuit and the outputs to the circuit will be elements in FP. And the arithmetic that the snark performs is arithmetic in FP. So uh, additions and multiplications modulo P. Uh, so everything is mod P except for one thing, which is the output the, that the proof system produces. Because this proof will be composed of elements of this, uh, of this curve E. And these points uh, are represented with coordinates over FQ. So now the, this proof pi, uh, pi one contains elements of FQ. And moreover, when we consider the verification algorithm in the second step, we're going to do the stuff with this pi one. So we need to be doing um, FQ arithmetic in particular because we want to do operations with these group elements uh, like uh, an exponentiation or a pairing evaluation, this kind of thing. So now we have a problem because we want uh, to use our snark that was instantiated for dealing with FP arithmetic, but we have a statement that deals with FQ arithmetic and P and Q are different primes. So what we can do is to take another curve that is defined over FQ and instantiate another copy of the snark that deals with FQ arithmetic. 
And of course, if we if we're not careful, the output of this proof pi two um, will be over a different field, and we have just uh, delayed the problem. But if what we do is take this second curve defined over f p, where p is the same prime from the the beginning, this output will be uh, again uh, dealing with f p arithmetic. So we don't need a third snark. We can just reuse the the first one, and we can just alternate sort of zigzag between these two proof systems. Uh, and do this recursive computation for as long as we want. And the interesting thing is that we only need two curves to do this. And so this is exactly the problem I was presenting at the beginning. Uh, the problem is how do we find actually the uh, pair of curves in these conditions? And as I said, the because we're focusing on, on pairing friendly snarks, because uh, so far they're the ones with uh, better uh, efficiency in terms of uh, Proof, uh, sorry, uh, proof size and uh, verification time. So we want this. Uh, we want to be able to compute a pairing on these curves. And what does that mean? So a pairing is essentially, and this is kind of a simplification, but enough for our purposes. A pairing is a, a bilinear map from two copies of the curve uh, to some uh, some finite field, some extension of F Q. Uh, and the degree of this extension is what we call the embedding degree of the curve. And actually the the, the target of the of the pairing is a set of uh, a group of roots of unity of order p, where p is the order of the curve. So we can uh, we can rephrase this this condition. This implies something because now we have uh, a subgroup. So the the roots of unity of order p is a multiplicative subgroup of the finite field. So the order of the subgroup must divide the order of the group, and so we we can. Uh, we can write this as that p must divide q to the k minus one, where k is this embedding degree. And the same for the other curve, q must divide p to the l minus one for some values k and l, these embedding degrees. And these values are exactly what determine whether a curve is pairing friendly or not. So basically, uh, pairing computation involves, among other things, some arithmetic in the in the extension field in fq to the k. So if you take a random curve, this k is, very, is going to be huge. So we would, you will be doing uh, arithmetic in a field that is exponentially large. And so you, uh, this is not efficient. You cannot compute the pairing in polynomial time. So on the one side, you want, uh, on the one side, uh, you want k to be uh, very small for the curve to be pairing friendly. However, you don't want it to be too small because if it's too small, uh, there's an attack that uh, will make you lose some, security, some bits of security. And the reason for that is that uh, whenever we have a pairing available that is efficient to compute, we can reduce the discrete logarithm problem on the curve to the discrete logarithm on the finite field, where there are um, some exponential time algorithms available. So to compensate for that, we would need to increase the sizes of the primes P and Q. So we want these values to be small, but not too small. And uh, just to give you an idea, something less than 10 is considered too small, something more than 20 or 30 is already too big. So what do we know about these, uh, these cycles? Uh, this is not going to be an extensive list of properties, but uh, one is that is very relevant for our work is the fact that there are no cofactors allowed. So you could think of relaxing the problem and considering curves in which the order is a small multiple of P and Q. Well, these curves will not lead to cycles. So we are stuck with a strictly um, prime order curves. Now we have a problem because so forget about the cycles for a moment. We are looking just for curves, and we want curves that are uh, pairing friendly and prime order. And these are kind of already hard conditions to get. We, there are many ways to get curves that are pairing friendly or curves that are prime order, but both at the same time, it's is slightly harder. So, oh. sorry. So there's essentially just one way uh, of generating curves that are compatible with these two properties at the same time. And that is what we call polynomial families, which are uh, pairs of polynomials, P and Q. And, and the name and the color is not an accident. Uh, these polynomials, when evaluated on, on integer values, will give us the parameters of, uh, of these curves. So to give you an idea of what these polynomials look like, they're not very large scary polynomials. They are uh, low degree polynomials with 
very small coefficients and they even seem to have some some symmetry in the coefficients. Uh, so these are uh, the polynomial families that we know, which have embedding degrees 3, 4, 6, 10, and 12. And this is actually all that we know. These are the only uh, families from which uh, we can get uh, prime order and painting friendly curves at the same time. Uh, this is not to say that there, there's uh, that this is an extensive list. I mean, it's extensive in the sense that this is all the families that were found. It might be that uh, some were missed so far, but it's kind of unlikely. So all prime order painting friendly curves uh, used right now come from one of these five families. So these seem to be our only candidates for uh, getting these cycles. So what do we know about the cycles formed by these families? Uh, on the one side, there's our, there are positive results. So the M and T uh, curves that I showed before uh, do form cycles of lengths two and four. Um, the problem with uh, these cycles is that, as I was mentioning before, embedding degrees lower than 10 are considered to be too small. Uh, they are uh, subject to this uh, attacking, which you reduce the discrete logarithm to the finite field. So to give a, to get a, a security level of 128 bits, with this kind of curves, you need to take primes that are uh, roughly 700 uh, bits long, which is pretty inefficient. So it will be a solution, but it's not a great one. On the other side, uh, there were some results already known about what we cannot do. Uh, it is known, for example, that Freeman cycles uh, do not exist in, in the sense of a Freeman curve forming a cycle with another Freeman curve, or the uh, same for BN uh, curves. But there were still uh, many unknown stuff in the middle. So what about a Freeman and a BN curve? What about a Freeman curve and another curve that does not belong or is not known to belong to one of these families? Uh, same for BM. What about longer cycles in which there are more like, than two curves, like uh, the MNT one here? So these are some of the questions that we try to tackle in our work. So what we did is, is actually very simple. Um, so we take this, uh, this divisibility condition that I mentioned before, the one that tells you the embedding degree, and we consider this polynomials because if the only way we know to get to this, uh, to get curves that are compatible with the cycle is through these polynomials, we might as well consider the condition as polynomials. And the nice thing about the polynomials is that, well, we can take one of the families, so say the Freeman family that I showed before, so I give you the concrete uh, P and Q, and the Freeman family has embedding degree 10, so K uh, in that equation will be 10. And we can check if it holds, uh, so, so you can check that the second equation holds for a small value of L, and if it holds, then we will have, uh, we, have we will have found uh, another family that is, uh, in a, that is in a cycle with curves from the Freeman family. Unfortunately, most of the time this will not work. Uh, this, is, this actually uh, does work for the MNT cycles that I showed before, but for all the other uh, families, this doesn't work. So we don't have the relation as polynomials. But we, may, we might still have uh, the relation as integers. It might be that the polynomial divisibility condition does not hold, but still holds for some uh, values uh, of x. But we observe that if that is the case, then it's only for finitely many values of x. And moreover, what is very interesting is that we can explicit we can find explicit bounds on these values of x. So essentially, we can uh, explicitly compute a large interval from minus something to something, uh, and we can be sure that all the uh, all the values of x uh, for a given family that would potentially lead to a cycle are within this interval. Anything outside of this interval will not lead to cycles. And that it, because everything that is outside this interval is already ruled out by the polynomial uh, check. So we have reduced the problem from infinitely many uh, cases to finitely many cases. And what can we do with finitely many cases? We can run an exhaustive search. So that's exactly what we did. Uh, so we took all the known families that were not known to form cycles. And we run uh, exhaustive search within these uh, intervals for all the values of uh, potential partner curves in the cycle up to 22. And of course, we didn't, find, uh, we didn't find any new cycles except for some uh, toy examples, uh, in particular these three, which as you can see have uh, like P and Q 19 and 11. So 
tiny values that, are, that have no cryptographic interest. But beyond these three, there were absolutely no cycles uh, found within this interval. And as I said, we are sure that there are no cycles outside of this interval. So we can conclude that these families uh, do not lead to paying friendly cycles at all. And the reason uh, that uh, we went up to degree 22 is purely computational. Uh, there's nothing theoretical that prevents you from going farther. Uh, it's just that this, uh, these intervals on X, the bounds grow pretty fast. So um, each one is much harder than the previous one to, to uh, run an exhaustive search on. So this is the same picture I showed you before. And now we can uh, modify it a bit and send more stuff to the negative results side. And we can say that uh, there are no cycles formed by Freeman and BN curves or Freeman and some or any other curve that is of embedding degree up to 22. And the same for BN curves and the same for uh, MNT3 curves, which I forgot to put into the picture. Uh, we still don't know what's going on with longer cycles. That might still be the case that they exist. So in summary, um, our, our argument has been uh, so far the, the, the idea that, well, we have to start from curves. If we're looking for cycles, we need curves that are prime order. That's a, that's a necessary condition. Uh, if we ask for what curves can we find that are prime order and paying friendly, the only approach that we know to get these curves is through these polynomial families. And what we have shown in our work is that these polynomial families do not contain any new cycles beyond the one that was already known. Uh, which, as I said, was pretty inefficient. Uh, in the unlikely case that the, the new family of curves, of prime order pairing friendly curves were found in the future, uh, this technique extends easily. There's nothing particular about the concrete families that, uh, that is relevant for the technique. So we might run it as well for any new uh, family. And uh, regarding the, the exhaustive search, uh, so our, our code is, uh, it just runs in a few hours in, in my computer. Uh, and we did it for degree up to 22. But uh, there's uh, quite a lot of room for optimization. So if you want to have a look at it, the code is public. And uh, I think uh, you can push the degree much higher with, uh, with some fine tuning. And uh, a secondary result that I did not mention in the talk, but uh, I wanted to give a, uh, to say some words about it. Is a, a formalization of the folklore, kind of folklore notion that cycles are hard to find. Uh, so what we did was uh, provide a concrete um, density estimate. So how likely it is to find a pairing friendly cycle among all cycles, which of course it's hard. There, there are many, many cycles, but not too many pairing friendly cycles as you might expect. But I think it's nice to have uh, some, some concrete uh, results on this. And this is the end of my talk. Uh, these are links to the paper and the code, and I'll be happy to take any questions. Any question? Hey, thanks for the talk. Um, so I wondered, I wondered if you had any idea how the computational resources required would scale um, if you did decide to investigate uh, longer cycles of curves. Right. So, so, so you mean like a cycle in which there are like uh, the one I showed for four curves that, that link to each other? Yeah. yeah for example. Okay. So I, I don't think it's uh, really a, a matter of computational resources. The thing is that this technique, uh, at, at the way we, we prove this, does not extend to larger cycles. So we would need first uh, new algebraic techniques uh, before considering the computational aspect. Okay. Thanks. And then, um, yeah, another question. Um, yeah, you have these uh, these computational estimates for the um, the density of the the pairing friendly cycles. Mm -hmm. um, do you see any avenues whatsoever to um, proving something about these estimates theoretically? In what sense, sorry? Um, like, uh, okay, so you have you have estimates for the um, you have estimates for the um, the the density of the pairing friendly cycles. Yes. Um, are there, is there any interesting theoretical stuff you can do with that? Could you prove that, uh, you, do you see any avenues to proving that the, the density tends to a particular constant? Is there any way to investigate this? Oh, um, as far as I know, we haven't considered uh, that. I, I mean, so the, so the main uh, 
the, the main idea of, uh, of, uh, of trying to prove that result, it, it was basically an exercise. It was, uh, so there's this uh, kind of general notion that these cycles are hard to find. I just wanted to quantify that, uh, but I don't see any further uses uh, beyond that. I see, thanks very much. Okay, so this is the end of the session and the end of the conference. And uh, uh, I wish you uh, going back home uh, safe, everyone, safely, everyone, and uh, see you in the next conference. And thanks to the speaker again and all the speakers. <laughs>